off last round with David still fleeing, and but God has begun to answer his prayers. And we see that um, uh, God has opened a door with a friend of David's, Hushai. Hushai has gone back to Jerusalem, and now Hushai is an answer to David's prayer to turn the council of Ahithophel, to, to, to overthrow that council. And so we, we saw David's attitude from the beginning, and we're going to see David's attitude again. It's a valuable lesson to us. We'll start in verse 1, read down to verse number 14. He said, When David was a little past the top of the hill, behold, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, uh, met him, with a couple of asses laid, uh, and upon them two hundred loaves of bread, and a an hundred bunches of raisins, and a hundred of uh, summer fruits, and a bottle of wine. And the king said unto Ziba, What meanest thou these? And Ziba said, The asses are for the king's household to ride on, and the bread and summer fruit uh, for the young men to eat, and the wine uh, that such be as uh, as be faint in the wilderness may drink. And the king said, And where is thy master's son? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he abideth at Jerusalem. For he said, Today shall the house of Israel restore me uh, before the kingdom of my father. Uh, then said the king to Ziba, Behold, uh, thine are all that pertaineth unto Mephibosheth, and Ziba said, I humbly beseech thee that I may find grace in thy sight, O uh, Lord, uh, or my Lord, O King. And when King David came to Behurim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, and the son of Gera. And he came forth and cursed still as he came. And he cast stones at David, and all... Uh, the servants of, the, uh, of King David and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left hand. Uh, thus said Shimei when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, thou son of Belial. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul and in, in, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom to the hand of Absalom thy son, and behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Then said Abishai, the son of Zariah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. And the king said, What have I to do with thee, you, ye sons of Zariah? So let him curse, because the Lord has said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? And David said unto Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth out of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone. Let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look on mine affliction and that the Lord will requite me good for his cursing this day. And as David and as his men went by the way, Shimei went along on the hillside over against them and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. And the king and all the people that were with him came weary and refreshed themselves there. Quite a passage. Quite a passage. You got a man here who comes right off the bat. According to the scriptures, if you'll go to 2 Samuel 19, he's uttering a slander right off the bat. Because when David finally gets victory over this rebellion, when God finally gives him victory, he meets up with Mephibosheth, chapter 19, same, uh, same book, chapter 19. Look at verse 24. And Mephibosheth, son of Saul, came down to meet the king, and had neither dress on his, uh, uh, dressed his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes. From the day the king departed until the day he came again in peace, 
And it came to pass that as he was come to Jerusalem to meet the king, the king said unto him, Wherefore wentest not thou with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, My, my lord, O king, my servant, deceive me, for thy servant said, I will saddle uh, me an ass, and that I may ride thereon and go to the king, because thy servant is lame. And he hath slandered thy servant unto the Lord, uh, my lord the king, but the Lord, uh, my Lord the King, is as an angel of God. Do therefore what is good, thine eyes. Down the road we'll talk about Mephibosheth, but first thing you see here, here's time of trouble. I want you to notice two things in the time of trouble that you can look for and expect. And I have experienced it myself. I'm sure you've experienced it. And you better prepare your heart for it. You better prepare your reaction to it. You hear me, boys? You better prepare, because it's coming. Time of trouble. You know what the devil likes to do in time of trouble? He likes to heap trouble on top of that to see if he can get you to break. So the first thing that comes is a man who's slandering somebody that David loves and making that man appear like he's turned against David. This is a person that David does really love and care for. He's the son of Jonathan. He's his beloved friend and a reminder of the relationship he had with Jonathan. And so here a man is trying to slander and interfere with that relationship. And then another man comes. Another man comes with a false report and speaking evil and cursing. You rest assured, when trouble comes, I don't, to you personally, to a church, Two things will happen, and that's why I'm careful. You heard me pray tonight. I'm careful. I'm very careful because it's not for me to judge whether God is against them and working against them. I don't know. I don't know. This is what I do know. I don't want His judgment against me. And that's what David is doing. He's saying, Lord, I'm going to let you judge this matter. I'm going to let you take care of this matter. You don't think Abishai, all David would have had to done is just, all right, that man's head would have rolled. I don't care if he had had a thousand men with him, Abishai would have went after that guy like a weed whacker, I promise you. He was a mighty man. Listen, he's my favorite of the three sons of Zariah. My favorite. I, I like him. I like him. I don't like Joab. Joab's got a deceitfulness about him. But I like Abishai. I like the fact that he's willing to defend his king. You know why? Because I like men with character in a church, women with character in a church who defend their king in heaven. Listen, we, we're lacking for that. Listen, it, it's, it's good Abishai has that boldness because it's going to help David later. He's going he's to face a giant later and Abishai is going to be, that boldness is going to come into play Abishai is going to rescue him. But you count on two things happening. When trouble comes, people will slander. Slander will be abundant. Don't be a slanderer. Don't be part of the problem. You know, slander is part of the problem. It's not part of the cure. You set your heart to be part of the fix and not part of the problem. Slander makes it worse. It heaps more. Because you know what slander is? I wrote it down. False tale or report maliciously uttered uh, intending to injure the reputation of somebody who's esteemed. You know what people will do? They'll slander people. They'll slander people to make themselves look better. Make themselves... You know what Ziba's doing right here? Man, I think he thought... This is just me trying to work the pieces of the puzzle out. Maybe you got another theory on it. But I think he thought that Absalom, because he, Absalom thought that Mephibosheth was with David, that Absalom would, would kill Mephibosheth. I think he kind of maybe thought that. In my mind, I'm trying to work that out. And Ziba's going to go back. He's dead, right? So he, dead men tell no tale, right? So, I mean, that's just my thought. I, I, don't, I don't have any concrete verses on it, but I'm trying to work the details out. Like, why would he do that? But I'll say this. I'll say this. Ziba is trying to make himself look good. He's bringing all these gifts to David. And in the meantime, he's taking a good man that David loves and slandering him. 
I want you to see this. I've seen this happen. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 10. You be careful you're not the one uttering a slander. If you don't know facts, take this the right way. You just need to keep your mouth shut. If you don't know what's going on, listen, the Bible says he that judge, uh, uh, judges the matter before he heareth it is, is, uh, is a fool, so on and so forth. I can't remember. Maybe I misquoted that, Jim. Did I? I need to look that verse up. I'm going to have to look that verse up. But the Bible speaks of judging a matter before you hear it. You need to hear all sides of the issue. Uh, listen, any people say there's two sides of the story. No, there may be multiple sides of the story. But you need to get facts. Don't, don't, and listen, just because you got facts don't mean it's okay to repeat it. Right? There's some things you just need to keep to yourself. Look at Proverbs 10. Look at verse number 18. He that hideth hatred with lying lips, and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. You know, you ever had people come and flatter you, and they're really just hiding a hatred that they have for you in their heart. They really don't care for you. They're kind of setting you up for a fall. Listen, you better be careful. The Bible says that kind of person... Listen, when you start hearing people utter slander, the best thing you can do to prevent people from uttering slander to you, the best thing you can do is you can say, give me the source that you got that information from. I want to talk to the individual myself and make a judgment of my own. And immediately, you know what you, oh, well, I don't know if I, I can, I can, I don't know if I can tell that. Well, listen, you shouldn't be telling the tale. If you can't tell where the source was from, you shouldn't open your mouth. Because that's not right. You need to, listen, somebody comes to you slandering. It may be something that has elements of truth to it. The worst thing you can do is repeat a matter. The worst thing you can do is a slander come, you repeat bits and pieces of it. Listen, keep, I, I, I'm just giving you, I've gotten so much trouble uttering parts of what somebody said that were not true and I did not know it was true. Well, untrue. Listen, the best thing you can do is keep your mouth shut. Get down on your knees and pray. That's the best thing you can do. That's the best thing you can do. It'll save you a lot of heartache. It'll save you from having to go back and apologize to a lot of people that you lied about unintentionally or even intentionally. It'll save you from having to do that. Listen, be careful in your life that you don't utter a slander. Proverbs 6. Here's what Ziba... Proverbs 6 reminds me of Ziba. Look at Proverbs chapter number 6. Verse number 16. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look. Now watch this. A lying tongue. He says it once. Watch and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet swift, uh, be swift in running to mischief, a false wit. Here it is. He says he hates, he hates a lying tongue. And then he also, <laughs> it's like he's stressing something here, a false witness that speaketh lies. He that soweth discord among his brethren. You know what he's doing here? He's sowing discord. He's, he's uttering lies against Mephibosheth. He's, it's a slander. A slander is a lie. It's a, it's a false tale. Look at Proverbs 19. Proverbs 19. Proverbs 19, verse number 5. You, when the Word of God says something twice, you better be careful. Verse number 5, a false witness shall not be unpunished. He that speaketh the lies shall not escape. Many will entreat the favor of the prince, and every man uh, is a friend to him that giveth gifts. All, uh, and all the brethren of the poor do hate him. How much more do uh, his friends go far from him? He pursueth them with words, yet they uh, are, are wanting to him. Look at this. He getteth with, uh, he that getteth wisdom loveth his soul, but he that uh, keepeth understanding shall find good. Verse number 9. 
Watch verse 5, false witness, so on and so forth. Verse number 9, a false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh the lies shall perish. Listen, you better be careful that your information that you give to somebody, and you better judge whether the information needs to even be distributed. Right? There's some, listen, listen. We may know of sins in other churches. We may know of other problems in other churches. What good is it going to do us? Let me just ask you this. What good is it going to do us at Academy Road Baptist Church to adopt the practice of spreading everybody's scully butt in the community? What good is it going to do? You want people to go out here when we have problems in this church? And we're going to. We're going to. Do you want people to go out here and do the same thing to us? But let me say something to you. We're not responsible for them. We're responsible for us and our actions. I don't care if they do or not. We need to learn that the best practice is prayer before talking. It'll keep you from saying too much. Maybe you were to get down and say, Lord, do I need to even talk to anybody about this at all? Or should I just keep this to myself? It's different. Somebody comes in and wants to join this church and you know something about them. It's a legitimate time to say, is this true or is this false before you join this church? That's a legitimate time. And that person ought to have enough character to answer honestly. And listen, from a church standpoint, we have to take them at their word. Right? We have to, if there's nothing against them that we know of, we've got to take them at their word. But the last thing we want to do is begin to disseminate lies in the community. Listen, who, listen, there's enough people that say, I don't go to that church because of the hypocrites in the church. The last thing we want to be known for is a church that gossips, a church that utters slander. I don't want that testimony. I want, I, I want the testimony in this community that that church, when they hear something, the first thing they set their heart to do is pray. Because it'll get us out of a lot of trouble. We, we will be careful about how we use the information we're given. So notice this, verse number 7, When trouble comes, also be aware of evil speaking. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. We see that. Here, here Shimei comes cursing. He comes cursing. Now, which one of you likes somebody to curse at you? Which one of you like to throw people to throw rocks at you? Here he is cursing, throwing rocks. You can just see Shimei just standing there with the sword. Just, just, just give me one swing. Right? You can see him. But you know what David realizes? I got my son chasing me. My own son is chasing me. I don't have time and God knows what's going on. I'm not fooling with this guy. That's one little guy. We can whip him if we want to. It's not a problem. Let God deal with him. David had a right heart. I want God to show me favor because I ignored him. That was David's issue. Let me tell you something. This is what I've learned from experience. When trouble comes and the evil speaking comes and it will, don't let it suck you in. Just let them talk. It's not worth it. Because you know where Shimei ends up in the end? David shows him mercy. He gives him a pass. Solomon comes along and says, I remember what you did to my father, and I'm going to let you go to one of these cities of refuge, and if you come out of there, you're dead. Even Solomon showed him mercy. But you know what he did? What Ziba is, or uh, Shimei was apt to do? He didn't care. Eventually he got to a point where he ignored all that, went to go chase somebody that, that, that did him wrong. One of his servants went to go capture him, and he wound up dead. God, God can take care of the issue. He does not need your help. He doesn't need your help. And listen, one of the hardest things for us to do 
And I, I learned this lesson um, here a, a hard way about five years ago. And you want to fix it. You want to go in and straighten the person out. And what we elected to do is keep our mouth shut and pray. And I saw God do a work that I couldn't have done with my tongue. My tongue would have destroyed that whole situation. Sometimes you, you better understand you're better off keeping your mouth shut. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Ecclesiastes 10. Is this where I was wanting to? This is not. Uh, let me see, maybe it's six. I'm a little dyslexic sometimes. All right, let's turn to Proverbs 15. I'm going to have to find out what I did there. Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15. One of my favorite chapters in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 15. Notice what he says in verse number 1 and 2. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. Here, Shimei is pouring out his foolishness. Look at uh, verse number 14. The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. Look at verse 28. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. The Lord, notice this, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. So here you see Shimei just poured out this foolishness. And listen, it, there's coming a time, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Look at uh, Proverbs 18, Proverbs 18, verse 7. The fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are a snare of his soul. The worst thing we can do, notice, David understands that God is well aware of everything that was said here. David is a man of character. Turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. You know, David, you read David's life, he had some, some, some flaws, but I'll be honest with you, uh, when you begin to look at his character, there's a character in David that's not in many of us. We look and see the flaw of his life, but he has some strong, godly characters, characteristics. Uh, and look at um, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. He says, Finally, be ye of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Notice what he says here. Not rendering evil for evil. That is not an easy thing to do. Look at this. Or railing. Some, you know what railing is? Somebody's constantly just hammering away at you, got a mouth on them, just, just, just jamming at you, hard as they can, they're railing on you. Notice what he says, not railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are uh, thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. You know what David's trying to do? He's trying to inherit a blessing. You know why he's keeping his mouth shut? Because he wants God to answer him. Listen, what we have a tendency to do when trouble comes and strife comes, we think we have to answer every petty little thing that comes up, and you don't have to. In fact, it is better off if you render blessing for that curse, and that ain't easy to do. But you can see God is going to bless him for it. Verse 10. For he that will love life and see good days... Let him refrain. Here's our problem. This, this, this little, little member right here, refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Listen what it says. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. I don't want God's face against me. I want Him in my favor. Listen, God's way works. Listen, we got a problem. That thing right there is a huge issue. And in churches where 
the fruit of the Spirit is supposed to be love, joy, peace, gentle, and you go on, mer- you go mercy, all of that stuff, all that fruit of the Spirit is supposed to be working in us. And yet that one member throws all of that stuff out the door in many churches. I don't want it to be ours. I don't want it to be ours. Last thing, I want to point this. Well, let's go to Exodus 14. I want you to see what David does is he allows, he allows, remember when he was um, there with Saul and he refused to kill Saul? If you go to Exodus 14, but over there in uh, 1 Samuel, David refused to, to, to kill Saul. And you know what? He elects. Saul is hunting him down like a dog. He elects God to judge him. David's, that character in David is it's a characteristic that lasts. You can just see it all through his ministry. He, he's, he's got a character where he's just willing, i got to let God take care of this. I'm not going to step in because I... You know why? Because the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. It doesn't. But notice, we need to learn, and this is a hard lesson, and, and it's, it's very hard for us, but the sooner we get to this point, the more peace we're going to have in our lives. We need to learn to let God fight the battles. Look what's said in uh, verse number 10, Exodus fourteen ten. And then Pharaoh drew nigh, and the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord, and they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, uh, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Uh, Wherefore hast thou dealt uh, thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Watch. Is not this the word? that we did uh, tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians, for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the, in the wilderness. Moses said unto the people, Fear not. Stand still. And see the salvation of the Lord, which He will show you to, uh, today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them Again, no more forevermore. Look, verse 14, here's the key. This is what David's doing. For the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Listen, it's better off if you let him fight for you. You know where your best place to battle is? You don't think God cares when one of his children comes before his throne and gets on their face and says, Father, I don't want to do anything wicked. You, I name them. You know what so-and-so said. Lord, I don't want to do anything that will cause a reproach upon your name. Could you please work this thing out before I do something foolish? What father, if he heard a child saying something like that, does not care and try to intervene to help that child. How much more our Father. Listen, the best place you can be is saying, God, you've heard what they said. You've heard how they have cursed and railed and mocked and slandered. Could you please help me? It's the best place. This is what I notice. By the time they get to where they're going, look at the last verse there last verse uh, that we read verse 14 turn to 2 Samuel back to 2 Samuel 16 we'll close right here 2 Samuel 16 Shimei was just about dead Do you think they would have got to the top of this hill or wherever they were traveling here and it would have ended the way verse 14 says it ended? Look at this, verse 14. And the king and all the people that were with him, they came weary. But notice what they did. And refreshed themselves there. My brethren, Hold your peace, 
trust God just a little bit further and he'll refresh you. Just a little bit further and he'll refresh you. You know what the Bible says? That we're not to be weary and well-doing. Well in due season, we will reap if we faint not. Brethren, let's not be faint. Let's not be weary of all the, the, the slanderous, evil accusations. I, they're going to come. Keep on serving the Lord. Keep on. Listen, the devil will try anything he can do to get you discouraged. Don't let that bother you. You just keep plowing on. It's the best thing you can do. Amen? Good lesson. Let's stand for prayer.